Hello, must readers. Okay. I'm Erin Papelka. I am here with Kate Brandis, author of The Promise of Pearson Orchard. Welcome, Kate. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So uh, quick, a little bit about Must Read Fiction. We are a community of readers that know that life is better with a novel in hand. And a little bit about Kate. She is a writer, artist, and environmental science. She earned her Bachelor's of Geology from Penn State University and her Master's in Hydrogeology, excuse me, Hydrogeology, should not stumble over those great words, um, from North Carolina State University. She started her first short story at age 35 and picked up her first paintbrush at age 40 and the promise of Pearson or Pearson Orchard this beautiful novel is her first novel so Kate it's such a pleasure to have you thanks for again for being with us I'm very pleased to be here great so please tell me about the promise of Pearson Orchard sure sure um, it is a family drama and it's set in um, Minden Pennsylvania which is a fictional town um, most of the story takes place in an orchard an apple orchard and um, there's sort of this kind of fractured family. Uh, and there are four characters in the, four main characters in the novel. There's Jack who uh, operates the orchard um, and then his wife, Leanne, who he's separated from um, in the beginning of the story. His brother, Wade, who returns to the town of Minden, um, now working for a company called Green Energy. And um, they are uh, wanting to lease, uh, gas rights for natural gas drilling a process called fracking um and then the fourth character is jack and wade's mother stella who's um, an environmental lawyer and jack asks her to kind of come and help sort of navigate this uh these questions that arise between the family and also within this community about um this natural gas drilling and so the the fracking piece of the story is kind of kind of serves as a metaphor along the storyline for this sort of fractured family and, and um, what they're kind of going through. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, talk about a really rich, complex setting for a novel, both in terms of the question of fracking, which is an environmentally really mm -hmm. interesting question, but also mm -hmm. this question of the personal dynamics of the family playing out together. And I think I read in an interview you talking about how the fracking process does sort of echo with this fractured family. Mm -hmm. And so can you talk a little bit more about that parallel and how it played into your writing of the novel? Yeah, sure. Um, I so. Um, as you mentioned, I, my background is environmental science, so I'm not, I haven't been a writer. Um, and uh, I've, a lot of my career has been about talking to people about environmental issues. Um, um, I've been, worked as a scientist, but I've also been kind of this bridge between sort of the community, lay, lay people, and this, the science behind environmental um, problems and, and trying to talk with people about that. So um, fracking in Pennsylvania, where I live is a big topic has been I mean in, in six or seven years ago it was quite quite something um, quite new for us and people want to talk about it um, and so I was talking a lot about it and I and I had this idea for the novel um, and at first you know I was writing this novel and it was a lot about the science piece because that's what I knew um, but it was interesting because as I was working more and more on the book and um, you know all, a lot of that fell away um, and uh, much more of it became about this family. And um, but so it was a while before I realized that, oh, the fracking is really just kind of this uh, mirror um, or kind of a metaphor for what's happening with this fractured family. And, and it really was, and it wasn't, it wasn't intentional at any, at any point really. It was something that kind of just organically occurred to me. Uh, so. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's really funny when certainly characters seem to take on a life of their own. And I don't know yeah. if that was your process, but you know, you, you maybe started working on this process with writing about fracking and then the family mm -hmm. said, nope, actually, you're going to write more about us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. that was for sure how it happened. And it took seven years to write the book. So it was and it was um, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, first, my first novel and really first attempt to write anything long. Uh, so yeah, it was quite a learning process, but that's that's kind of how it all came uh, to be. Absolutely. Well, seven years, it sounds like almost its own geological process. Of course, yes. that's a teeny weeny <laughs> time in geological time, but a lot of time yeah. in our lifespan. So congratulations yeah. on seven yeah. years of hard work and a first novel too, getting out in print. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And so 
you also live in Pennsylvania. Um, mm -hmm. And so the novel is set in Pennsylvania. So there's mm -hmm. definitely some parallels there. And you mm -hmm. have also worked professionally with geology and environmental mm -hmm. science. Yeah. So how did your personal and professional experience inform your writing of the novel? Well, in a couple ways. I mean, certainly like my environmental background and um, when I worked as, I worked as a geologist professionally for six years and I specialized in groundwater and how groundwater flows through the, through the subsurface. And, um, you know, part of my work was also to drill wells. Those were water wells, not fracking wells, but still I knew, I understood that subsurface um, environment really well. Um, so I guess uh, what that did is it opened up for me that possibility that I could write about this because I didn't, I knew the technical pieces, like that part didn't scare me. Um, I didn't, at the time, I was very naive about the writing and the creative piece and how much I had to learn there. But it, I think at least that was like a little doorway. I, I felt like, oh, I can write about this, you know. Um, I'm also up in a very rural area and um, my, I have a long line of family from a rural area. My, uh, both my sets of grandparents live in a place that is fracked and part of my family has leased their gas rights. So I, I knew that piece of um, you know, I knew that experience from listening to uh, family members discuss that. Where I live in Pennsylvania, um, we don't live where fracking occurs right where we are. Um, people would be affected if it was maybe, you know, up river of us. Um, but I live in an area that currently doesn't, there are no fracking is allowed. So um, as I said, I would talk to people about fracking. And what was interesting is, it was a very specific conversation I was having with people. Um, and it was a conversation where, you know, fracking wasn't going to be allowed. Um, so they had an opinion about it. And, um, but they weren't faced with trying to make this decision about, right. you know, they weren't living really, it was not, it's not really a rural area um, in the places I was having this conversation. And they weren't living with that decision of, um, well, could I send my kids to college if I, fra you know, if I allow yeah. leasing on my land? And this sort of, some of those very hard decisions. Um, so I, I found the whole topic, just this very nuanced um, issue with a lot of different sides. And, you know, uh, so I think part of my intention for wanting to write the book was really to kind of represent as fairly as I could all of those sides and how complicated it is. Um, so I'd say those are the kind of the two pieces, that rural background and then my science background um, kind of informed a lot of the writing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Did your family yeah. come to you with questions about the science and about the geology as they were considering whether or not they would lease their rights? Nope. It wasn't really so much that in their decision making. I think it was really, as I think it is for a lot of people, very much financial, you mm -hmm. know, um, you know, and it's a financial decision. And uh, so that was, that was their, you know, their experience. Yeah. Yeah, fascinating. And certainly yeah. an interesting place, you know, being in a place where fracking is not allowed, but being mm -hmm. so close and so connected through your family to places where they, yeah. they have gone forward with it. Right, right, wow. right, right. Wow. Yeah. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I've, I love nature. I'm uh, passionate about the environment. I've worked, you know, it, to, for that my whole life. Um, and, you know, so a lot of those, as I said, those conversations I was having here where fracking is not allowed. Um, I was talking with people who also share those, so those same views, mm -hmm. but again, weren't faced with those hard decisions. And so, um, you know, it was a very interesting to have one conversation here where I live and have quite this other different conversation, um, you know, from with my family members, you know, basically in places that um, this was actively going on. So it was really striking to me at the time uh, when I started writing the book, how different they were and how those worldviews were so separate. And um, also that, um, you know, a lot of what I was reading about fracking at the time was in big city publications and that kind of thing. And I really felt like that rural voice um, was not out there at all. So I was really um, interested in kind of, that's why I set the story in this very rural place. Uh, because um, I was interested in that voice. Yeah. Oh, and that, uh, so I live in Spokane, Washington, and mm -hmm. it does seem that the city rural divide is a pretty fundamental one. I've also yes. lived in Oregon and that one is yeah. pretty huge. You have these big urban centers in Oregon. Yeah. It was Portland and along the Willamette Valley. Um, and right. then pretty much the moment you get out of those urban centers, things changed pretty instantly. And it yes. does seem like a, um, 
a really fundamental divide in terms of priorities and in terms of this, in, like in terms of the rural population feeling like the cities are trying to tell them what to do, which mm-hmm. feels really disempowering and yeah. like a very profound change. So what an interesting kind of way to go mm-hmm. into the story and to really think about trying to explore that. Right, right. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that's so true. And I think there's so much misunderstanding on both sides, you know, city dwellers and rural, and there's a lot of assumptions. And um, so it's pretty interesting to kind of know both those worlds. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, And to get to explore it through a novel, which gives you the space to really play with all of those pieces and that you don't, what's a, what's such a beautiful thing about fiction is you don't necessarily have to take a side though. I'm sure you have an opinion, but you get to sort of explore the nuance where you have these characters Mm -hmm. who some of them might believe what you believe. Some of them might believe the opposite and you can just sort of play with it as all those forces come, come together at once. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that was um, one of the most interesting and, um, treasured things about writing the novel was that I had to, I do have opinions, right? Um, But I had to, I wanted to write this novel that I felt like kind of represented all the stakeholders in some way. Um, And I had to write characters in a very, what I hoped was, you know, a very believable manner that, and make them sympathetic, um, even though I didn't agree with their view yeah. or what they were doing. And so, you know, I just think that for me, it was a instruction and kind of compassion and understanding of other people and um, other views and that everybody has their view. They've earned it in some way, you know, because of where they've come from. And it's all way more complicated, you know, right. uh, people are complicated and uh, we're made by so many things. Our views are shaped by so many things. And so um, it was just a really fun, kind of fundamental reminder of that, which um, uh, it was, it, it was a wonderful experience that I did not expect at all. So wonderful. Yeah. Can you talk to me a little bit more about your creative process? You are a writer and a painter, yeah. but also yeah. a scientist. So, you know, how did, how did this creative journey start for you? You know, I, people do ask me this a lot. Um, and it, to, to, to say the start of it, it's, it's, I, I will try to explain it, but it's not something I can really put, put my finger on. Um, I, I had always worked as a scientist and I poured a lot of my energy into that uh, through my mid thirties, my career. Um, and uh, my, I had a, my first son, um, I have two children. I had my first son when I was 35 and for whatever reason, um, after he was born and I was working full time and I had this small child and it was a very inconvenient time to try to learn to write creatively, but for whatever reason, <laughs> that's when I decided that it was something I wanted to do. Um, it, I was not somebody who had that burning desire my whole life, but suddenly I did really want to try to do that. And I would, you know, I taught myself basically, you know, I would write, read books about how to, you know, whatever. Um, and I was always a good writer uh, from a technical standpoint, scientific standpoint, but it was quite a quite a long journey to learn how to tell a story in that long format um, or short format. I, I spent two years trying to write a short story uh, too. So, you know, it was long, it takes a long time, but um, you know what? I think that the, all I can say is I had this thing that bubbled up and I just felt like I had to honor it. And, um, and so I did. Yeah. And the same thing with the painting, you know, it's like, again, like something, Oh, I think I, I want to try that. And so I did. And, um, you know, for me, the painting is kind of like, uh, I need it in order to do the writing. I need another form of creativity to kind of take a rest (laughs) from the writing. And it's like, um, the processes are are similar, but the one is so visual, uh, and so satisfying because it's so quickly done versus the novel, (laughs) which is so long. Um, so, uh, that's why I do the artwork. It's, it's, I, I, think of myself primarily as a writer, but I do the artwork as kind of like this other creative resting space where I can contemplate, you know, and kind of take a break from this immersive uh, writing thing. So that's the best way I can describe it and how it all happened. And <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It does seem like the yeah. muse does never, like the muse never picks a, a, a great time to show right. up and say, Hey, you need to do this. So, right. you know, right. throw it into the mix with a new baby and working full yeah. time. So tell me more about yeah. your painting. What is your preferred uh, medium? 
Um, I, I do watercolor. That's the only painting I've ever tried. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I'm more or less self-taught. I've taken like a couple little classes, but, um, and I, I, I think of myself as a dabbler for sure in the painting, but I, I am working on a project now that in, includes watercolor and um, paper and thread. So it's a, it's a paper quilt project. Um, and it started because I was having this, this, when I first came out, when I came out with my book, um, it was very, it was an interesting like kind of crisis of identity, I, I'd say. I mean, not a crisis. It wasn't a bad thing, but it was, um, I'd always been this writer. Everyone knew me as a writer, as a scientist. Sorry, I'd been a scientist. Everybody knew me as a scientist. And suddenly now I have this weird new identity as writer. And so I felt like this strange kind of split, you know, um, and then a little bit of time goes by. And then now suddenly people know me as writer and not, you know, the scientist kind of per person, the identity of scientist is fading. And so, um, so I wanted to do a project, an art project that kind of um, helped me work through this. Um, so I ended up uh, interviewing six uh, women who also are scientists and artists. Um, and they're, they're local to me, uh, and they're all different, but, um, and then I'm making kind of quilt series or small quilts of paper and watercolor that are sewn, um, each one inspired by one of these six women. So there's a six in a series and, um, and that's been really wonderful. Like, you know, it's been wonderful to hear their stories and their experiences. And again, like have that little resting space of being able to work on that to um as i work on a new novel so <laughs> absolutely yeah. no no rest for the weary over there my goodness yeah. and so with working on the paper quilt project these other women have you been able to talk to them about how their scientific mm -hmm. scientific identities have impacted their artistic identities and vice versa for sure that's exactly what i talked with them about so i have i interviewed them um each one and then you know uh, wrote down the whole interview and it's, you know, you can look at it on my website if you want, but um, that's what we primarily talked about. You know, this, this um, interesting life when you have this sort of logical mind and that you also have this need to create and how they can inform one another. Um, and what's interesting is that all the stories, all the experiences are quite different, you know, so it's not a one uh, you know, I'd hoped, I'd hoped in some way to find like, oh, we're all doing the same thing. We're all struggling with the same thing, but it's all very different. And it just is a reminder that we're all human beings just trying to live our lives absolutely, and, uh, the best we can, you know, uh, but it's, it's been a wonderful to talk with them and to uh, share in what they're doing and, um, and yeah. Yep. And I, for some reason, the sewing piece is, is, uh, I, you know, trying to like knit ourselves together or knit myself together or whatever. Uh, um, so it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Must readers definitely go yeah. to the Kate's website and check it out. Some of the images are fantastic. It's really yeah. beautiful to see that. And especially thread on paper because paper feels so fragile and thread feels a little bit more permanent, even though it is so thin and so fine. And so it's a really lovely juxtaposition. Yeah. So, um, you talk to book clubs and I know yes. must readers, another plug. If you have a book club, mm -hmm. um, Kate Brandis will stop by if she's close enough in person or she can join mm -hmm. by Skype or FaceTime. So I just wanted to talk to you about what is it that you've learned from some of your, um, appearances with book clubs and joining book clubs? What have you learned from their discussions of the book? I just love book clubs so much. I have to say, I just, um, it's a wonderful time to be able to hear other people's reactions. And um, it's incredible uh, what I've, how people view these characters and the story and, and what they see in the story that I never uh, imagined, you know? So it's really, it's really uh, fantastic. And I'm always interested, there are those four main characters. I'm always interested to see who uh, identifies with who, you know, like people identify with a certain character and um, it's really fascinating and, and how people also respond to them. Um, you know, they're all very, sometimes very different uh, responses to these, these complicated people. So, um, so it's always a pleasure to talk to people about the book. Um, and it is a, the book is, you know, it doesn't, it is nuanced a bit. So it, there always is a lot of room for discussion. And, um, and I've been in some interesting discussions about, uh, about the story and about the choices that the characters make. And 
um, that the community makes. So always lots of fun. Yes. And now we can add discussion moderator to your long list of qualifications. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Great. Yeah. And so to, you know, kind of round things out, your book came out in April on Earth Day. So congratulations. Yep. Yep. So how did you celebrate? Because I imagine that talk about worlds coming together. I imagine Earth Day and your first yeah. time coming out was a, a bit of a collision of worlds. How did that feel? And how did you celebrate? Yeah, it was it was a crazy day. Um, there happened to be um, a local science march that day. So there was the science march going on in yes. uh, D.C. And uh, there was also a local one. So I had uh, two uh, book openings um, that day. Uh, one at the uh, science center that I worked at when I was composing the novel. Um, and one at a local bookstore later in the afternoon. And then the science march was in between. So it was, uh, it was a fun and crazy day. Uh, but that's how we celebrated with lots of apple pie, um, given the apple orchard setting and, um, you know, um, apple cider and all kinds of good stuff like that. <laughs> and I saw also on your website that you have a, a recipe for apple cider that book clubs could use as part of their yeah. journey into the book as well. So apple cider yep. with a wonderful book, uh, The Promise of Pearson Orchard. So Kate Brandis, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. And thank you so much for writing such a fantastic novel and giving us so much to think about and so much to talk about. Thank you, Erin. Thanks very much.